Maria Konnikova is the author of New York Times best-selling book, The Biggest Bluff, How I Learned to Pay Attention, Master Myself, and Win. Maria is a regular contributing writer for The New Yorker, whose writing has won numerous awards, and she graduated from Harvard University and received her PhD in psychology from Columbia University. While researching The Biggest Bluff, Maria became an international poker champion in just one year and the winner of over $300,000 in tournament earnings and inadvertently turned into a professional poker player under the tutelage of Eric Seidel, master player who resides in the Poker Hall of Fame. You are going to love this conversation. Maria Konnikova, I have to start by telling you the truth from my heart, which is, I love you. <laughs> Susie, I love you too. <laughs> this is how friendships are made, with love, up front. Maria, this book, could you see? All this? Oh, that, that warms my heart. I do the exact same thing. <laughs> I was actually even a little worried preparing for this interview because I'm like, well, is she going to give me four hours or what? Because I, <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of questions, um, but we're going to we're going to dive straight in. And I, I mean, there, there's so much I want to to ask you because this book, Maria, has you know, it's about poker, right? Like it's you know, it's about the biggest bluff. It's about you spending a year dedicating yourself to poker to win a championship or attend a championship. And you achieved it. Like you, I mean, and this is a very male field. This is a male field, not many women. It's very complicated, a lot of rules. But you did this because you wanted to truly understand the distinction between what's luck, what's skill, what we have control over, what we don't. Could you tell us a bit about what motivated this for anyone who hasn't yet read the book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for people who've heard me talk about this in the past, um, you know that I'm not a poker player. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I did not grow up playing poker, playing games, playing card games at all. One of those people who actually dreads playing games. So <laughs> I love my niece and nephew with all my heart. And the scariest thing they can do is take out a big board game <laughs> and put it on the table. And I'm like, uh oh, okay, I love you. I will play this with you, <laughs> but only because I love you so much. So I'm not, you know, I'm not someone who's in that world. Mm -hmm. And as you said, my entry into poker was from a totally different perspective. Yes. Um, I went through a year in my life where just everything went wrong. I got really sick. Uh, my grandmother died just in a freak accident. You know, mm -hmm. She was totally healthy. Um, my mom lost her job. My husband lost his job. It was just the spiral of one thing after another happening that made me just stop and reflect mm -hmm. and think, wow, you know, you buy into this idea of the American dream, you know, Protestant work ethic, you're from England, yes. <laughs> you guys have it too. You know, if you just work hard enough and you're just skilled enough, then everything will work out. Um, and that's bullshit <laughs> at the end of the day, mm -hmm. because you do have to work hard, that's necessary, but it's absolutely not sufficient. Um, you also have to get very, very lucky. And those moments when you are very, very lucky, it's so easy to just dismiss it um, and to forget about the luck and to think, yeah, look at this, I'm working hard and I'm doing well and I deserve this and it's all wonderful. Um, and so I really wanted to figure out a way to explore this and to try to find out, you know, how do you draw the distinction because life is so messy and it's so noisy. You can always make excuses. You know, when things go wrong, you can always blame, you know, blame the weather, <laughs> blame this, blame that. When things go well, it's so easy to take credit and to say, yeah, you know, I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to work out. And it's so hard to disentangle the two. And one of the things that um, I'd studied when I was in grad school in psychology was the illusion of control, which mm -hmm. is this idea that we think we're in control when we're not, when we're in situations where we're not, we attribute way too much skill to ourselves. Um, and so how do you, you know, how do you get past that? How do you not just explore that, but actually become a better decision maker? How do you actually learn 
to understand what you do control and how to maximize your skill, but at the same time, figure out what those limits are and where, you know, chance and variance take over and where you just need to learn to let go because that's also part of it. You know, you need to control the things you can, but then when you can't control it, got to just take a deep breath and let go and uh, let the cards come as they will. <laughs> Maria, I'm like, can this, can Maria be my life coach? I'm a life coach, right? I'm like, can Maria be my life coach? Cause I swear this is a book about coaching because it's about the brain, right? It's about what our, our interpretation, what we assign meaning to, what we've never assigned meaning to. One thing that I thought was so interesting in the book is how you explain that when it's good luck, we're like, oh yeah, I kind of earned this. I'm on a roll, right? When it's bad luck, we're like, oh, I'm a, a good break is coming. There has to be a reason to this. I mean, I've even, I haven't had that recently. I think extra because I was tuned into your book and the message. I heard someone say on a flight, oh, I've had a couple of bad weeks. Something good's got to come my way. <laughs> and it's so funny how we kind of make these yeah. inferences and we believe like, I'm lucky. This is my, this is my reward or I'm on yeah. a, there's a streak here or, you know, things haven't been going so great. Something good has to come my way. Yeah. Gambler's fallacy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, in with gambling, with poker specifically, you know, there's statistics, there's observation, which pay attention. We're going to speak about that in a moment. Um, there's superstition. There are so many kind of facets at play, like so many moving parts. And you had such a concentrated time frame to learn this game. And of course, you want to win because you're playing with real money right? Your money, there is risk here. And there is, there, there are so many kind of you know, moving factors. When, when I read your, your subtitle, how I learned to pay attention, master myself and win. I know your coach, Eric Seidel, uh, told you always to pay attention. Can you tell us a bit about that and the role that played with your success? Yeah. Um, it was the first thing he told me when I, you know, was dumb enough, naive enough to ask him, you know, what's the one thing I need to do? The one thing now, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly, right? Tell me the one thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm one right. One yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and rather than like say, are you insane? Mm-hmm. He said something which I still go back to all the time because it's so deceptively simple, those two words, right? Pay attention. And yet it's one of the hardest things in the world. It's yeah. so hard to pay attention because mm-hmm. the way that, so you mentioned that the book does kind of dive into the brain and my training originally was in psychology. Mm-hmm. And what you know from psychology and from how the brain works is that our default state is to mind wander. So the brain actually by default isn't paying attention. It's constantly scanning the environment to see what it should pay attention to. Because back when we were evolving, you know, all these threats all over the place and, you know, you have to kind of let your attention drift to figure out who's going to kill me, what's going to kill me, you know, what, what do I have to focus on? Um, and these days, you know, it's, it's not that it's notifications on your, you know, on your iPhone or whatever it is, mm-hmm. but it's always diverting our attention in kind of in, in that same way. And so when we want to actually pay concentrated attention, it's really hard. That is what takes resources, effort, cognitive effort, emotional effort, because you have to make a conscious choice to be present, to be mindful, to be in the moment, to focus on what's going on in front of you and to not let your attention drift. So you make a conscious choice to put your phone away. You make a conscious choice when you're sitting at the poker table to actually follow what's going on always, even when you yourself are not actively involved in a hand. That's your time to observe, to see What's everyone else doing to try to pick up on all of the cues on what they're saying, but not saying on the dynamics. And that takes such a lot of energy. And it's funny because, you know, I, um, I'm someone who's been doing yoga for over a decade. You know, I start each morning with yoga practice, meditation, all this stuff. I've written about mindfulness many times. My first book, Mastermind, was actually about mindfulness. And yet, and yet, until I started playing poker and having, you know, real money on the line, having all of these things there, um, I still, you know, it's something that I'm still struggling with. And poker really forced me to 
kind of distill what it was I needed to do. So as I think I write about at some point in the book, you know, it's one of the most Zen things I've ever done because Mm -hmm. it kind of forces you to be in the flow and in the zone if you want to do well. And you can actually tell the difference. You can tell when your mind is there, when it's present, when you're actually kind of in the zone and when you're not. And you Mm -hmm. can see a difference between the two because either your money is growing or it's not. (laughs) And I mean, and what's so interesting is there is stamina. It's not like, oh, here's a 30 minute game, pay attention. This goes for hours and hours and hours yeah. watching, watching. I remember at, at one point you um there's what you're observing Eric and he's playing your coach and he's playing and uh, you notice that other players are checking their phone, looking at the TV that's always there, you know, looking for the waitress for a drink. And he's just so focused. I mean, isn't focus a bit of a lost art? It is. I absolutely think it is. But but I will caveat this by saying we've always thought focus is a long is a lost art because it's always been hard for people to do. So when I was researching mindfulness for the first time, um, like really diving into it um, for for my first book, um, I learned that medieval monks had written about their inability to focus and they had a name for it, acedia, the noonday demon. And it was about, man, you know, my mind's all over the place. I'm supposed to be focused on my prayers. And all I can think about, you know, is lunch and sleep and this and that, and it's horrible. And so I I think like it's a, it's, it's a uniquely human thing where it's, it's just deeply ingrained in who we are, but that said, so technology isn't completely to blame and the modern world isn't completely to blame, but it's gotten harder because technology, as I've kind of suggested in my last answer to you when I was talking about, you know, the, the brain constantly scanning the environment, the technology is like crack for our default mode network because there's so many things going on and we never have to be by ourselves. We never have to be alone with our thoughts. We never have to be bored. We never have to learn how to inter- entertain ourselves because there's constant connectivity and there's constantly something we could be doing. One of the things that I actually teach when I teach writing to my writing students is I make them spend a day without their cell phones and they usually hate me for it because they have to write about it after Um, but they don't they hate me and then they don't hate me because it's actually a very powerful exercise to try to figure out you know who am I what's going on in my mind what are my thoughts what are my hopes what are my fears you know what goes on in my head And we never take the time to focus on that because we're always distracted by something else. Um, And so we lose the art of engagement. We lose the art of focus of, of presence. Um, And so, and so I think it's, it is an increasingly lost art, but I'm optimistic that it's one that everyone can reclaim if they choose to. And you say in the book that you, you you say this more than once, the importance of being reflective versus reactive. And this is actually, I mean, it truly, this is coaching on, on so many levels. It's like someone said something, I'm going to get her. He said, you know, he did something. I want to straighten him out. Like there, <laughs> there's rarely a breath or a, and you actually share one of my favorite stories in this book too, towards the end, the story about the village farmer. Yeah. That, you guys, I, I'll link to that story too, but it's an excellent story, which is, you know, really not making assumptions about what's good and bad and you have so many delicious quotes in this book too from so many great writers in history but you know not not making a snap judgment this is good that's bad and what I learned from you Maria which completely fascinated me was in poker it's not the best cards that win most of the time like it there really is this human element it is the dance right between the the cards and then your own decision making but I, I feel as you know learning from you this ability to be reflective to pause to choose like and to to keep choosing and I have to say this is I've never heard this before ever in in anyone and I've also with athletes I mean truly I've never seen this you've had a spreadsheet working (laughs) with a coach yourself to monitor measure track your emotions can you tell us about that because I I wish everyone including me did this (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I ended up working with a mental coach as well, Jared Tendler, um, who was great and who really helped me identify a lot of the 
emotional issues that I had that I didn't think I had because I'm a psychologist. I know this. You know? Exactly. <laughs> I'm good. I've studied this. Uh-huh. <laughs> I'm not supposed to have, you know, I'm not supposed to have any weaknesses in my mental game. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things he asked me to do at the very beginning, which I didn't do right away because I thought it was stupid. <laughs> and it took me a, a while to actually do it. And then I realized, damn, like he knew what he was talking about. Physically doing this was, was very important. It was to make a spreadsheet. And it had different columns. And it was one of these things where I had to learn to figure out, okay, you know, how am I feeling at this moment, at different moments in kind of the poker tournament, I'd have to monitor it. What happened? You know, what's the trigger? Why am I feeling this way? Okay, let's dig down even deeper. Let's figure out why this is a trigger. And then, and this is really important, what am I going to do next time? What am I going to do next time this happens to avoid getting into this emotional state so that I can keep making good, clear-headed decisions? Because the truth is that once you're emotional, once you're in that hot state, it all goes out the window. If you haven't prepared and you don't have a game plan and you don't know exactly how you're going to act, you're going to break down and you're not actually going to be able to execute it. And oftentimes you even see yourself, this has happened to me so many times, going through this emotional state in poker, it's called tilt. Um, and I think that that's a great term oh, yes. for, for every- Tell us um, about tilt. <laughs> <laughs> so tilt is just, it's, it's exactly that. It's letting emotions get into your decision process. Mm-hmm. And it, um, the emotions are incidental. They're not integral. So that's important. They're not actually part of the decision. It's just how you happen to be feeling. And that's in, incidental to what you're thinking about. And yet it's influencing you to act in a certain way. And you can use tilt as any part of speech. I'm tilted. I'm on tilt. That person's so tilting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, do, do whatever you want with it. But the idea is when you're on tilt, when you're in that moment, you can't do anything about it and you can't, you're no longer clear headed. The only moment where you can figure out what to do is when you're calm out of the hot spot, you know, not in, not in that situation when you have time to reflect. And so what this spreadsheet system forced me to do was kind of isolate all of these different things. What are the things that make me tilt? What are the things that affect me? How do they affect me? What do they do to my decision-making? How am I going to counteract that so that I had a very concrete plan of action? Then we talked through it, of course, refined it, but only after I wrote them all down did I think through them. It's one of the reasons that I think it's actually such an effective learning tool to teach someone else what you're what you're doing because that way you have to truly understand it because if you explain it to someone then you start seeing oh wait I actually don't understand there's like this gap and this gap because so often you just think you understand it in your own head but you don't really and so this kind of this spreadsheet was the same thing for yourself without talking to someone else because you can be like oh yeah yeah I know exactly what makes me tilted I know what my triggers are No, you don't. Not unless you actually take the time to stop, write them down, think through it and do that deep self-analysis. It's not pleasant. It's not something that I think Mm -hmm. is a joy to do. It's probably why I avoided it and why Mm -hmm. we avoid it in general. I don't want to look inside the deep psyche of my my mind. You know, leave that, leave that alone. (laughs) I mean, but this is like the ultimate immersion in self-awareness. Right. Which, most, you know, I always think, oh, you know, I'm self-aware. I know I know it will trigger me. Um, but to the extent that you had to do it to stay so calm and consistent, it wasn't just like a one off. Right. It's it's something that you just keep coming back to. You also speak in the book about the importance of asking why. Why am I doing something? Why is someone else doing something? And you say something funny like imagine all the therapy <laughs> or, or, or the time and money we'd save if we just kind of said, well, you know, why am I doing this? Or maybe what, what is that person's motivation? Maybe it's a good one. Like, yeah. But just the agony that we sometimes feel when we don't question. And um, you also say, you know, less assumption, more inquiry throughout. Would you say that poker is just really a game to, to succeed in it? Just really understanding yourself and being willing and having almost the generosity to observe and pay attention to others. I think that's a huge, huge part of it. And I'm so glad that you saw it that way because so many people are like, 
you know, they, they look at poker, they look at poker players and they say, oh, you know, vicious, cruel, zero sum, awful, you know, war, you're out to kill each other. And sure, in one sense, you know, there are winners and losers. Some people will walk away with money, others won't. That's just, that's the game. But the way that you understood it is actually what draws me to it, because I think it actually has made me a much more empathetic person, much better able to see the world from others' points of view, because that's what you're constantly doing. You're constantly trying to figure out what are people saying? What are they telling me? What are these dynamics? You become more observant. You become more attuned to nonverbal cues, which are really important outside of poker, just to be a good listener, to be a good friend, to be a good person. And they've made me, I think, a much mentally stronger, better version of myself, which is also good for everyone because I have done so much of that kind of analysis for poker. And I take it from poker into my everyday life and it, improves how I'm able to deal with stress, how I'm able to approach different situations, how I'm able to kind of think through different situations. And so, yes, to me, that's the beauty of the game. And that's what's interesting about it. And there's always something to learn there because at the end of the day, it's, it is a game of people. It's also one of the reasons why I far prefer playing live poker to online poker because there's, something about sitting in front of a computer screen where all of these skills don't translate quite as much. Right. And you have these amazing stories too, about different people who bluffed you, like one lady who's like showing you a picture of her kid and you have this female solidarity or so you think, <laughs> and she cleans. So, oh God. <laughs> so I'm just outraged for you. And then I'm like, well, but this is it, right? Like this is when we don't pay attention, we just, we're instantly trust. And then yep. you want to say like, cause you studied con artists too. Yep. And how you could, you really can never tell. Mm -hmm. That's humanity in a nutshell, though, right? All of these interactions at the poker table, it's just the play of life. You see it all playing out during the day. You see people at their highs. You see them at their lows. You see what they're willing to do. You know, everything kind of comes out and everything's fair game. Now, what that woman did to me, and for people who haven't read the book, you know, she invoked female solidarity and, you know, oh, it's us against all the boys and against, you know, the world and then proceeded to just shame, completely bluff me and take all my money. And it's on me, right? She didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I've never done something like that because it's just not something mm -hmm. that it would occur to me to do, but I'm not judging her for doing it, you know, smart that if she can get what she wants that way, that's great. Just understanding all of those dynamics. And yeah, our default is to trust. And even in a game like poker, when, when you know that the game is based on bluffing and deception, it's part of the rules. You're playing a game. This is not real life, right? The rules of the game are it's such it's that you're allowed to lie. You're supposed to lie. <laughs> Maria, my favorite chapter in this book, I mean, it's hard to say because they're all brilliant, but my favorite was the one entitled No Bad Beats. <laughs> Can you explain what a bad beat is? And then we'll talk about why there aren't any. Yes. I actually want to read something from the No Bad Beats too. So if you explain what it is, I'm going to get to my quote. Great. And, we'll, so, and then I've got a couple of questions. Sounds good. So bad beats are a situation that comes up in poker um, when you get your money in as a favorite. And what that means is statistically speaking, you should win most of the time, 65% of the time, 75% of the time, sometimes 98% of the time you're yeah. supposed to win. And then the money goes in and your opponent hits the miracle card and you lose. So you end up on the quote unquote wrong side of variance. You're a statistical favorite and yet you end up losing. Bad beats happen all the time. They're supposed to. One of the things that I say over and over is that statistics are statistics. They don't care if you're on what side of variance you are. They don't care about what happened before. It's kind of what you were saying at the beginning with people being feeling like they're overdue or like, yes, this lucky streak will continue. No, probability doesn't care. Probability is just probability. It just exists. And it doesn't care what happened before. And it certainly doesn't care about you personally. And so sometimes you're going to get bad beat after bad beat and you'll feel like, oh my God, you know, am I doing something wrong? And if you do the analysis, you say, no, I've gotten my money in as an overwhelming favorite every time. Okay, fine. I should keep doing the exact same thing. But it's so 
easy to get dragged down and to focus on the bad beat and to complain about it and to say, you know, oh, this is awful. Woe is me. And I will explain why there are no bad beats, but first I will let you read <laughs> what you well, want to read. If you can see this, I mean, my underlining is crazy. I've got, I've got um, exclamation, exclamation points and say obsessed. Um, this is what I love. If you suffer a bad beat in life, it may set you back considerably more and last a lot longer than in poker. All of a sudden, your framing matters significantly. A victim of the cruel cards? This may serve as something I think of as a luck dampener effect. Because you're wallowing in your misfortune, you fail to see the things you could be doing to overcome it. Potential opportunities pass you by. People get tired of hearing you complain. Oh, so your social network of support and community also dwindles. You also don't even attempt certain activities because you think, I'll lose anyway, why try? Your mental health suffers and the spiral continues. I mean, are we talking about poker? Or are we talking about every single thing that happens in this world? Didn't get the apartment, didn't get the job, didn't get the man or the woman. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really. So the complaining about the bad beats, because the reason this came up in the book is because you wanted to um, go to your coach and explain what happened and why it was wrong. And he was like, stop right there. Yeah, he he actually shut me up, which is if you ever meet Eric, he's just the nicest, mm. most soft spoken, sweetest guy ever, just an absolute teddy bear of a human being. And for him to shut me up is jaw dropping, right? <laughs> and and he said something that really stayed with me. He said, Do you have a question about how you played the hand? And that made me stop and think and say, well, no, I guess not. You know, I had top set, which is a great hand in poker on, you know, on a board where nothing else was possible. I had definitely no, literally no other hand could beat me. We got our money in. And then, you know, this person ended up winning with a draw and he said, okay, fine. That's it. You know, all then I don't care how the hand ended because the outcome that's variance. That's just the cards. That's chance. That's what you don't control. All I care about is how you played, your decision process, the skill, the decisions that you made and why you made them. If you have a question about it, let's talk. If not, move on, forget about it. And then he went on to say that telling a bad beat story is like taking your trash and dumping it on someone else's lawn, which is really, really true because it's toxic. And it's toxic to you while you're carrying that bad beat with you instead of thinking about other things and letting your mind, you know, analyze other decisions and move on. You're just dwelling in it, letting it poison you, probably reaching the wrong conclusions. Like, oh, I guess I should have never gotten my money in with top set. I should have just waited and seen what happens just in case. No, wrong conclusion. Absolutely wrong conclusion. You made the right decision but the outcome wasn't good, that's fine. The decision is not the outcome. The outcome is not the decision. And then it's obviously toxic to other people, which is what you just read, because you're taking that trash and you're dumping it on someone else. So now not only have you carried it around with you, but you're polluting their brain with it as well. Why do they need to hear that? What purpose does it solve? Nothing. It doesn't solve anything. And we see it all the time in life, right? Everyone yes. wants to say exactly why it, why it went wrong. And you speak about, you know, the victim victor kind of mentality when it comes to having a bad beat, having something, you know, unexpected happen. Do you think, Maria, that there is a time for um, processing any negative emotion and then going straight to, okay, like decision making? Or can you like go straight to, okay, I'm, I'm back to neutral, reset? Oh, I mean, I think that you know, it's unfair to say, don't experience negative emotion. And I think it's also counterproductive mm -hmm. because you're human. Mm -hmm. And you know what, as much as you talk about, don't tell bad beat stories, don't do this, don't do that. Mm -hmm. It sucks when you lose, right? It sucks to be knocked out of a tournament. Like that moment hurts when, when you, when you kind of look at it and you're like, damn it, you know, <laughs> I, I, that should have, that should not have happened. Of course, it's always upsetting, but the trick is to not dwell, to acknowledge it, to say, okay, that happened. Did I make the right decision or not? Mm. And then think through it and then just move on. And I've gotten to the point um, at least in poker, but also in a lot of life situations where I don't even remember my bad beats. Like, I don't remember what happened. I don't remember 
why I was knocked out. I don't remember the outcome. All I remember is, did I make the right decision or not? And if I did, I'm happy. If I didn't, if I actually made a mistake, that's what keeps me up at night. You know, going back and thinking through the things I did wrong um, and the ways that I actually made decisions that were potentially a little bit, a little bit off. But it gives me things to work on. It gives me things, it gives me a target instead of dwelling on, you know, oh, I messed up. Okay, this is what I did wrong. Here's how I'm going to work on it for next time. But that's these, you know, that that's more upsetting to me than making the right decision and then getting very unlucky. Um, that said, you know, like I said, it, it always sucks. <laughs> Oh, and the thing is, you know, one thing that I say, or one thing that I coach on is like, the, the things will go wrong, right? The, the, you will get rejected, you will fail, especially if you really have lofty dreams, whatever your ambitions are, there will be things that don't go your way for sure. Um, but the important thing is your bounce back timing. Like, is it a year of, you know, sitting it out? Or is it, you know, three minutes? Right. <laughs> what's your timing to bounce back? Are you like, I'm back in 15 seconds? Or are you, do you need like an hour? I mean, it depends. Yeah. For, for poker, it's, it's usually pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Just like um, straight on to the next thing. Yep. Yep. Yes. Um, but if it's, a, you know, it depends on how, how bad the beat is yeah. and how long it takes me to think through it. Because sometimes in life, you know, when you don't, when something really doesn't go well, um, it, you know, it takes a long time to try to disentangle. Did I do something wrong? Did other things go wrong? You know, what was, what was the process and what should I be focused on for next time? And that's a processing time that isn't necessarily dwelling on the bad beat as much as trying to analyze the situation and direct that energy in a productive way. But I'm not going to move on until I figure it out. Um, so I guess that's a, it's, not quite the same thing, but it's still thinking about the situation and trying to see, well, what can I learn from it? Um, you yeah, know, it's an expansive that energy that you bring yeah. to it it's versus a self-loathing. Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. So it's an expansive, curious energy. Oh, Maria, like this is so, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't tell you how much I love this conversation. <laughs> One thing that I love too from your book uh, was how, how poker has changed you. Right. So and I love this um, just short story that you, you share where, you know, someone's giving you a speaking opportunity and you say, you know, it's not enough. Essentially, the, the, the fee isn't high enough. And your husband's like, oh, <laughs> you've changed. <laughs> oh, like, you know, you're a different woman. And then you say, well, his that, exact words were you take a lot less shit from people than you used to. <laughs> <laughs> how is that? How has poker changed you in that way? I mean, I take a lot less shit from people that I used to. Why is that? Like, why is that now? Do you, like, what did poker do to make you more just resilient and assertive? Yeah. Well, I think part of it is that poker is, you know, anywhere from 97 to 98% male. Mm -hmm. So just that number in and of itself should just let you pause for a second and say, wow, you know, that that's like taking our everyday dynamics and like putting them on steroids because we live in a male dominated world that's been built by men for men, but poker just really blows that up. And unless you confront it, um, you're going to pay the consequences as I did at the beginning. Yes. It actually took me a while to work through all of my issues and to realize how much I'd internalized a lot of what society had always told me, you know, about being nice and not putting up a fuss and not being aggressive and, you know, how important it was to smile and be liked. And, you know, those are messages that you just have pounded into your head from day one. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to kind of to realize how often I did let myself be bullied and how often I mistook shows of bluster and confidence for the real thing. You know, poker really teaches you that someone looking strong and confident is not the same thing as them actually holding good cards. And you realize how often in life, you know, the, the men who've always been on top of the world they just say, oh, yeah, 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 I've got that. I know how to do it, all this stuff, all this false confidence. And they get the job over someone 
who's a female who's like, well, you know, I know this, but I need to learn this. I'm a, you know, starts caveating and nuancing and actually saying, oh, these are the cards I have in my hand. Look, (laughs) the the man is like, here we go. I've got this. (laughs) Which leads me actually, because I love how you speak about, you know, being a woman and how that's impacted you because Eric tells you at one point to play more aggressively, right? To, and there is a incredible, um, Let me just, I quote you here, Maria. This is page 100, um, where you talk about, you know, playing kind of passively, playing safe. And you say here, oh, I could weep. There's a false sense of security in passivity. You think that you can't get into too much trouble. But really, every passive decision leads to a slow but steady loss of chips. Oh, the visual, just the visual. And chances are, if I'm choosing these lines at the table, there are deeper issues at play. Who knows how many proverbial chips a default passivity has cost me throughout my life? How many times I've walked away from situations because of someone else's show of strength when I shouldn't have? How many times I've passively stayed in a situation, letting it get the better of me instead of actively taking control and turning things around? Hanging back only seems like an easy solution. In truth, it can be the seed of far bigger problems. Can we speak about that just for a moment in terms of knowing when to be assertive, knowing when to take more action versus kind of this more female passivity that we've been taught to make it safe? Well, it's, it's one of these, it's, it's this false sense of security that if I, you know, if, if I'm not seen, if I just kind of coast along, if I'm passive, if I don't do anything to draw attention to me, then everything will be fine and everything will be good. And that's the way to get ahead and, and succeed. And that's like I say in poker, absolutely false because your chips are not going to build themselves up. What happens if you're constantly passive in those moments when you suddenly start to be active, when you suddenly start to be aggressive? All of a sudden people will be like, oh, she has a monster hand. She's super strong because She's just been sitting here quietly for two hours and all of a sudden she's woken up. I'm going to fold. So are you going to be able to make money with your strong hands? No, because the moment that you are you know, suddenly in it, people know you're, you are actually strong. You lose your ability to bluff. You lose your ability to navigate these situations to kind of have these sorts of dynamics where you don't have to have the best hand to win. And as you said before, Susie, in poker, it's usually not the best hand that wins. Most hands don't make it to showdown. It's the best player who convinces everyone else to throw their cards in the muck um, before they even hit that final card. Um, And that's, that's the beauty of the game to be able to maneuver like that. And you realize that you know, nobody knows what cards you hold except for you, right? All they see is how you portray yourself, how you carry yourself, how you act, what you do, how you do it. That's the only information they have. And so you suddenly have the freedom to tell different stories, to make your story into something else. And if you learn how to do that persuasively enough, then you will become a winner. And the the answer isn't be insanely aggressive all the time, Mm -hmm. bluff all the time. Mm -hmm. It's not the answer either. It's to try to figure out a successful rhythm for you, but to stop going into the default patterns for your own mind and for your own behavior. For me, the default happened to be passive. And I think that's probably true of a lot of women. But for a lot of players actually who are starting out, they're way too aggressive and they bluff way too much. And you can take advantage of that. And I've actually been the beneficiary of that many times. When I see that, I can exploit that. Um, And so it goes back to the very beginning of our conversation and self-knowledge and learning to sit down with yourself and figuring out what are the mistakes I'm making in my behavior? What are the defaults? What's my status quo bias? And my status quo bias is to just kind of sit and be passive and wait for stronger hands. And that's what I have to fight against because it's a false sense of security to think that the status quo is is fine. The status quo is actually making an active decision um, to, to remain in that status quo. And that's not always a good thing. Mm-hmm. 
And you also speak about cognitive embodiment, which I think is really powerful. And it's fun to test in real life, in different situations, even socially speaking. I was speaking to somebody recently who was really nervous to show up at an event. And I said, you walk in slowly. <laughs> and it doesn't matter how you feel. <laughs> right. Because there is some evidence to this, right. That how we, if we want to act the way that we want to feel, there is some connection there, but I feel like you've truly mastered this. <laughs> I mean, knowing how to show up, knowing kind of what's because inaction is action, right. So when you yeah. kind of take action in a way that's kind of supportive of your goal, even if it feels a bit uncomfortable at first or different, it's the, it's the game element. It is the game element. And one of the beautiful things about poker, which is one of the reasons why I actually want to bring more women into the game, because yeah. it's such, I feel like it's a tool that they can use to be stronger versions of themselves, is it is a game. And so you can play around with different elements and different personalities and different, just different angles of yourself, I'm not saying become a different person, but it's a game space. It allows you to explore these different personas and to explore, you know, what embodied cognition can actually do because it's been embodied cognition is something that's been a factor in psychology for years, for decades. And yet people always push back against it because it seems like such a weird thing, but our minds and our bodies are so intimately connected. Um, our minds have so much power over our bodies, but our bodies also have power over our minds. It's a feedback loop. And so it does matter what signals you're sending. And, you know, people always say cliches are often true to a certain extent. That's why they become cliches, but fake it till you make it. There's actually some truth to that. You know, dress for the job you want. There's some truth to that. I remember when I was, you know, 21 years old, um, just out of college, I graduated young. So I was, I had just turned 21, just moved to New York City, kind of just starting out, you know, in this huge overwhelming place where I don't really know anyone, have no connections. And I remembered my decision the first time I was at a party where someone asked what I did. And I said, I was a writer. And it was just a conscious, like it was a conscious decision to say that, even though I was not yet able to make a living as a writer, I was writing at night. I was writing on weekends. I was working in television during the day, you know, and doing something else. But I made that conscious mental choice to identify myself as a writer. And I think that was the first step to actually making it a reality. Um, it's not a moment that I've thought about for a long time, but I think it's very appropriate here. It is appropriate here. Say what say what you want to be. Say the thing. Like take take the and look. What one thing that I've learned, you know, from you, Maria, is that there is risk. This is. I mean, people think poker gambling, like your grandmother in the book. You must read this book, my friends. I truly. I know you have to to run, Maria. I can truly. I could keep you forever. Be careful. Um, but there are so many stories here about what you had to overcome. Even you know, people in your family entering a completely new world. Even just the 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 geographical, like the casino style. Every Everything you just had to this reads like fiction when I read a book when I read a book that's non-fiction and reads like fiction I'm like wow what I mean it's it, it's 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 so gripping you could just read it again and again and Maria uh where like where can people find you at, but first of all or two things I want to know if people can find you so you can direct them there but also what's next for you like what can we expect from you Maria what's sure coming? sure so people can find me um Usually I'm most active on Twitter and also Instagram. So I'm M. Konnikova on Twitter. Um, on Instagram, I'm girl named Maria, but girl doesn't have an I because someone else took that handle. And one day I would like someone to please get it back for me. <laughs> no I and girl, got it, yeah. <laughs> um, and I have a website, mariakonnikova.com, but I'm very bad at updating. <laughs> so oh, it's a little bit out of date. Uh -huh. But that's, that's normally where I am. I don't spend much time at, on Facebook at all. So that's probably the worst place to find me. And then um, next, what can we learn? Yeah, so I'm working on a bunch of stuff, some of which I unfortunately can't talk about. Okay. Um, but other things that I can talk about, I will say that some, some of it involves screen. So I'm actually moving into new type of writing. Um, and I'm actually in Vegas right now working on a new project for Audible. Um, so yeah, it'll be an Audible original. This is actually my second Audible original. The first one I've already done, but hasn't come out yet. So you guys can expect it out um, in a few months. So for all of those all of those people who actually enjoyed 
listening to The Biggest Bluff as opposed to reading it, this one's for you because it's going to be audio first. Oh, Maria, thank you so much for the work that you do for, for being here with us today, showing us how to master ourselves, how to win, how to pay attention. This, these are truly valuable permanent life skills, tools that you can use just I can't think of a situation where they're not relevant. So wow. thank you, Maria, for your generosity, for being here, showing up um, and teaching us so much. I've learned so much from you. Well, thank you so much, Susie. This has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And I too feel like we could speak for hours. Oh, so, I'm coming. Thank you. I'll be on the next flight to Vegas. Be careful. All right, let's do it. <laughs> thank you so much, Maria. Thank you, Susie. <laughs>